Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show where in this video we're going to talk about resveratrol and some recent insights into whether or not we should be considering resveratrol a friend or a foe. So firstly I'll talk about what resveratrol actually is and previous studies that show resveratrol can extend lifespan and then we'll look at the results from this recent publication that looked at resveratrol and tried to get a better understanding of the molecular underpinnings of resveratrol in human cells because you know it's always great to know what these different compounds are doing within our bodies. And then we'll take that information and come up with an opinion about whether or not resveratrol is really good or bad for cells. So firstly then, what is resveratrol? So here is a chemical structure of resveratrol. And so resveratrol is a phenylpropanoid and it was first isolated from the roots of the plant, Veratrum glandiforum. So it's a naturally occurring compound and it can be found in different foods such as the skin of grapes, blueberries, raspberries and also in peanuts. And so resveratrol is a phytoalexin, which is a class of compounds that are produced by plants under stressful conditions. So this can include being infected by pathogens or being physically harmed, such as by cutting, crushing or irradiation. So therefore, resveratrol is produced in greater quantities by grapes experiencing stress. And I've taken this quote from David Sinclair's book Lifespan, because he mentions about resveratrol in this book. And They believe the reason that plants produce resveratrol is evidence of xenohormesis, the idea that stressed plants produce chemicals for themselves that tell their cells to hunker down and survive. Plants have survival circuits too, and we think we might have evolved to sense the chemicals they produce in times of stress as an early warning system of sorts to alert our bodies to hunker down as well. So the reason I mentioned that quote is because later on in this video we'll come to look at the results of this recent publication, Genome Wide Screens Reveal That Resveratrol Induces Replicative Stress in Human Cells. And the reason that there is a lot of interest in understanding resveratrol has come from previous studies that show that resveratrol can extend lifespan in a variety of different muscle organisms such as yeast, worms, fruit flies, as well as mice when fed on a high fat diet. And so because of these studies, there's a lot of interest in being able to increase resveratrol intake through diet by taking resveratrol as a supplement, because if you wanted to get the same level of resveratrol as that used in in vitro studies, uh, one study suggests that you would need to drink 111 glasses of wine. (laughs) But the interesting question is how is resveratrol achieving these increases in longevity? What is it actually doing to the cells? So probably the most purported mechanism is that resveratrol can increase the activity of SIRT1 and SIRT1 is a sirtuin. And sirtuins are a family of NAD plus dependent enzymes and they have a variety of different functions within a cell. But one of these functions is thought to be the activation of stress resistance pathways, which might be an explanation to why lifespan extension is seen in these different model organisms when given resveratrol. But that's just one potential target of resveratrol. Other studies seem to suggest that resveratrol may also act through activation of a protein known as AMP kinase, and also by inhibiting another protein, cyclic AMP phosphodiesterase. But irrespective of the molecular underpinning of resveratrol, other studies show that the cell-based level effect of resveratrol seems to be an inhibition of cell proliferation. And this is also evident from what David Sinclair wrote about in his book Lifespan. He was studying yeast and yeast that had been given resveratrol. And what he noticed was the resveratrol-fed yeast were slightly smaller and grew slightly more slowly than untreated yeast, getting to an average of 34 divisions before dying, as though they were calorie restricted, whereas normal yeast would only divide about 25 times before it dies. However, we are not yeast, and still the story with human cells is still a little bit unclear. So the authors of this recent publication wanted to further understand how resveratrol can affect cell proliferation. And the way that they did this was performing a CRISPR-Cas9 chemogenomic screen in a human cell line. So the human cell line that they chose were NAM6 cells, which is a B-cell leukemia cell line. And they gave them the concentration of resveratrol that partially impairs cell proliferation of these cells 
and then they induce this CRISPR-Cas9 screen. And whilst that may sound a bit complicated, effectively what a CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screen is, is in each of the different cells, a different gene is effectively knocked out. And some of the cells, depending on which genes are knocked out, may grow better or they may grow even more slowly. And so over time, cells that have knocked out specific genes will increase in the population. And the way that you can identify which genes are being knocked out is by sequencing the guide RNAs that were used to knock out the gene in the first place. So I'm not entirely sure if that made any sense, but effectively what the screen does is that it enables chemical genetic interactions between respiratory and the cells to be assessed to give a better understanding of what impact resveratrol is having in the cells. So interestingly, the authors found that when a set of genes were knocked out, that caused the cells to become sensitive to resveratrol treatment and become sick, were enriched for genes involved in DNA replication and genome integrity. And even more interestingly, they also repeated this experiment not using resveratrol but using another drug known as hydroxyurea that is a known inducer of replication stress and there was considerable overlap between the results of the cell knockout screen with both resveratrol and hydroxyurea treatments. So what does this actually mean? Well, both bits of evidence suggest that resveratrol treatment may be causing replication stress within cells. And this was further supported by seeing phosphorylation of a protein known as CHECK1, which is part of the DNA replication checkpoint. And this phosphorylation event occurred at similar kinetics where the cells were given resveratrol or hydroxyurea. So taking all the evidence together so far, it supported the viewpoint that resveratrol treatment was inhibiting DNA replication. And so if we go back to the article that I showed you briefly at the start of the video, is resveratrol a friend or a foe? The reason that this question was asked is because inhibition of DNA replication can result in replicative stress. And replicative stress is a key driver of genomic instability. That includes things such as mutations in the DNA, DNA rearrangements, and the occurrence of double-stranded breaks in DNA. And these features are early stages of tumorigenesis. And in fact, replicative stress is a hallmark of cancer. And so to quote from this article, given the interest in resveratrol and terostilbene, a resveratrol analogue, as putative nutraceuticals to modulate lifespan, these findings are timely, potentially raising a word of caution on such usage. So what does all of this mean? Well, unfortunately, it's still a bit unclear. Firstly, the chemogenetic screen that they performed didn't identify the two proteins I talked about earlier, SIRT1 and AMPK. And so this supports the notion that resveratrol could be impacting several biological processes through distinct molecular mechanisms. And so this most likely highlights one of the limitations of doing these kind of chemogenetic screens in that you're still using an in vitro cell line model, which doesn't fully recapitulate what's actually seen in vivo, whether it's a model organism or human studies. And for these reasons, it'd be more interesting to see the response of different cell types to resveratrol treatment. But it highlights definitely that we still need more extensive mechanistic studies to really understand the full picture of how resveratrol is impacting DNA replication. But the second thing that's worth mentioning is the dose of resveratrol. In this study, they used 60 micromolar of resveratrol when they treated the cells. This is more than six times higher than a recent report that suggested a genome protective benefit with low doses of resveratrol. So therefore, I think the best take home from this paper is best summarised in this article, which is the discoveries presented really reinforced the importance of considering the potential safety concerns of increased doses of these compounds such as resveratrol, especially in people with increased susceptibility to genomic instability. And so there may be a delicate balance between the dose of resveratrol and the potential benefits and adverse effects of resveratrol. And this is well summarised in this figure here, where you can see that maybe at lower doses, there's interactions with these proteins such as the sirtuins and AMPK that is giving this increased lifespan in different model organisms. But at maybe higher doses, it's causing replication stress, which can result in DNA damage and genomic instability. And so this study also raises the importance of really trying to understand the bioavailability of resveratrol and the concentrations that the cells are being exposed to, as it's currently not clear necessarily what 
dose is too high or too low by just supplementation and obviously it would also depend on the supplement itself so it'd be very interesting and probably quite important to try and to get more insights into this so hopefully you've learned something in this video and as always thanks for listening